Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, we do have a video for you tonight. Uh, tonight's Meet the Entrepreneurs is about Arctic DX, a uh, life sciences company who are tenants here uh, in the building. They have novel uh, technology uh, for the uh, diagnosis of macular degeneration, and I'm gonna let them tell you the story. So can we roll the video, please? specifically identify that someone has an increased risk for a disease based on their genes, that's very, very different than telling them that they have a risk of a disease uh, that's related to the general population. Arctic DX is in the business of commercializing genetic discoveries uh, to improve healthcare. In the diagnostic space, particularly in genetics, which is the area that we focus on, uh, because of a very favorable regulatory and structural environment for getting genetic tests to market. You can get a genetic test on the market in the space of 24 to 36 months for, I would suggest to you, in the $10 million range. We have a test for macular degeneration. And it's well known that smoking is very, very bad for macular degeneration because uh, it interferes with the uh, with the metabolic processes in your, in your eye. So you can tell somebody that they should stop smoking and here's a general risk. But now you can tell somebody, here's a specific risk associated with you because you have these bad genes and you're smoking, your risk of getting this disease is significantly higher than the average population. And it should have an impact on people's behavior. We hope to get the colon cancer test um, to a point where it will be interesting to the payors to want to screen uh, people for colonoscopy um, and we hope to do that in the next two years. And our macular degeneration test is on the market. We're now uh, got over a million dollars in annualized revenue and that's growing well and we hope to find a partner for that in the next couple of years. We intend to use these products as we spin them out and spin them off. Uh, to fund a continued stream of genetic discoveries into the healthcare system. Canada has a tremendous investment base and a number of talented researchers and there is actually um, quite a lot of funding uh, on the discovery side. Uh, the challenge is getting those discoveries to market. The people you run into in the halls, the programs that Mars has set up to provide infrastructure for startups, they will do market research, they provide uh, mentoring, they have provided us a program to engage a uh, sales and marketing executive uh, for our launch period of time on our macular degeneration test. They have introduced us to angel investors. They have been very supportive in getting us into a number of different forums where we could get exposure for our products to the, uh, both the financial community as well as the marketplace. It's been really invaluable for us. We're very pleased with it. I'm actually waiting for somebody to do my genetic screen and say, based on what they found, I should have been dead a long time ago, so just, just take all the cash you've got, go out and blow it, because God knows how much longer you've got, but no one has told me that yet. So just a billboard of something coming up this Friday. Um, I know it may be a little premature, but for those of you who are really thinking big, um, we've got a great, some great speakers uh, in from, for example, the TSX Venture Exchange talking about valuations in clean tech. In clean tech, it's a really hot topic now, and so um, I think you'd, uh, for those of you who could come to this, I think you'll find it quite interesting to think about how do people value, put a value 
on companies, certainly at the ones that, at the stage that they're going public. Okay, so enough billboarding. Um, I'm delighted, as always, to, to welcome back, as a repeat speaker, uh, Professor A.J. Agarwal. A.J. is the Peter Monk Professor of Entrepreneurship at U of T's Rotman School of Management. He teaches courses on strategy, innovation, entrepreneurship, and creativity. And just to keep him busy, he's also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of, of Economic Research in Cambridge. Now, um, you know, despite all that, he actually had a good start in his professional career because he did a, a Bachelor of Science at UBC, followed by an engineering master's joint with an MBA. So he started the, the slide off of the straight and narrow science and technology and moved into, into business. Um, you know, AJ has worked in fields robotics, digital media, television broadcasting, music performance, software development, wireless biotherapeutics, and pharmaceuticals. What it doesn't say in, in his CV here is I know he works with small companies, he's been on the boards of a number of small companies, and, and what AJ is talking about tonight is, is business models. It's, you got a great idea. How do you make as much money as you can from that idea? And those of us who are techies don't just think, well, I made a widget, so I guess I'll sell widgets. There may be a lot more out there because you can make a better widget. So without any further ado, AJ, over to you. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Tony, for that kind introduction and inviting me back. Uh, I'm a big fan of this course, Entrepreneurship 101, which I think was the brainchild of, of Tony and Cynthia Go. Um, it does a great service to the community uh, in Toronto, particularly around, the, around U of T. And so thank you very much for your continued efforts in running this. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about the topic of business models. And in the context of uh, Entrepreneurship 101, um, you know, business models really you know, is a genteel way of, of saying, you know, how, how to maximize revenue uh, from, an, from, from some kind of invention. And to some extent, you know, the answer is make the product um, and sell it. And we're done. Um, the only reason this topic is interesting is that there are multiple ways of making money from an invention, and the best way is not obvious. And so it's there, I have yet to find an, uh, an invention uh, for which there are not multiple approaches to how to uh, build the business around that, uh, around that idea or product or service. Um, and very often, the route to monetization or the, the business model for that invention uh, that is the one that seems apparent at first glance uh, uh, upon reflection isn't, uh, doesn't appear to be the best, the best way forward. So what I'm going to do today is just try and give you a little bit of nuance uh, for those who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this issue uh, of cracking the process of going from invention to product and product to sales. Uh, you, know, uh, you, might, you might think that, in other words, the simplistic view here is that uh, after you have an invention, you, you manufacture your product or, or, or uh, organize your service, and then you sell it. And ultimately, once you have that pattern down, it becomes two optimization problems. One is in the production of your product, how to uh, minimize the cost. And then the second optimization problem is in maximizing sales. And um, what I'm going to do today is just talk about uh, uh, cracking that thought process open a little bit uh, and thinking about what are, the, uh, what are the salient issues that can uh, provide some kind of, of uh, insight into, into thinking through the, the business model process. I've organized my thoughts into three points. So essentially when you leave today, hopefully you'll have some sense about uh, the role of power, uh, incentives, 
and uh, appropriation or value capture in design of a business model. So let me start with power. Um, I'm going to describe all this in the context of a case. Uh, and so each of my three categories I'll walk through in the context of a case of a graduate student. This student is um, an Iranian student who came to UBC, uh, did his undergraduate at Sharif, came to UBC uh, to do a PhD, and uh, did so under the guidance of uh, Professor Lawrence uh, in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department uh, in the area of uh, robotics control systems. And so I'm going to follow his case and walk through the business model decisions that he makes uh, in, his, uh, in his business. Um, so, and the student, by the way, is the one on, the, on your right. Um, this is uh, after a few years, his team, uh, and uh, not atypical for a technology firm. It's predominantly male. And uh, everybody, this is a, the whole company here, and, and everybody except one person is an engineer. Uh, there's one salesperson, um, and the rest are, are engineers. Uh, let me tell you about the product, uh, and, uh, and then we'll walk through the business model. So the product here is, uh, is the application is in mining, and the, the useful part, why I showed you this picture of Peter Lawrence was Peter Lawrence, uh, just in addition to being a great researcher, has a very keen nose for identifying industry problems. And for those of you who are graduate students, I think uh, you know, we've seen this time and time again that the graduate students who work with advisors who are, uh, have a strong industry orientation uh, seem to have a much higher propensity towards, um, towards entrepreneurial activities. And what Peter Lawrence said to uh, Sharam Tafazali was, in looking for your research problem, let's go and visit some uh, potential clients and hear what their real what their problems are and so uh, he ended up visiting a number of uh, in this case mines and uh, in the case of, of one of this one happened to be Syncrude they identified some technical uh, some problems that would make for a, 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 um, a challenging PhD uh, dissertation and in this case um, this wasn't the the, the first problem that they worked on, but it was a second or third problem, was the, what they call the broken tooth problem. So these are these big shovels that are used in mining, and uh, occasionally, uh, so this, you can see what the, in, in the top right corner is uh, the front of the shovel have teeth, and the teeth are used when in, in mining to break the rock, and um, the shovel, of course, for lifting up material and putting it into a truck. And these teeth are steel. And occasionally, they break. And when they break, uh, they are often fall inside the bucket. And when the du bucket dumps its load into the truck, the tooth, along with all the, the rock and material, is taken in the back of the truck to a crusher. And the crusher crushes the material. However, the crusher doesn't crush a steel tooth. And if, uh, very often, if, uh, in the rare occasion when the tooth is in the truck, uh, the tooth can damage the crusher. And the crusher uh, is an expensive piece of equipment to, to damage in the sense that every hour of downtime of the crusher is uh, tens of thousands of dollars. So the average downtime, depending on who you talk to, is somewhere between $100,000 and $500,000 every time a crusher goes down, on average. Um, so the, the, the problem became how to prevent a steel tooth that is broken off uh, from entering the crusher. And so what uh, uh, Sharam and his team worked on was a broken tooth detection system. And essentially, if you look at the top left corner, um, that they mount a camera on the top of, uh, on the arm of the shovel, and it takes uh, very rapid pictures of the uh, shovel, because these machines are so big that the person operating can't see the, the bucket. Uh, the bottom left is just a picture of a, of a tooth that's broken off that's in, a, in the rock pile. In other words, it's hard to see. Um, and what, what that does is it, is it there's essentially, the, the, it's, this is an image pr uh, processing problem of identifying when a tooth is broken. 
And this is, the problem is non-trivial because it's a harsh operating environment. There's dust. It's often dark. The rocks that get stuck in between the teeth look like teeth. So there's a number of things that make this a non-trivial problem. And the essence of the solution is to have inside the cab of the truck uh, a CPU that uh, basically just tells the operator uh, when a tooth has been broken off. And at that point, the operator can go out and check the tooth. And if there is, in fact, a tooth missing, they can dump the load so that it never makes it to the crusher. And um, that's the essence of the product. Okay, so <clears throat> now uh, let's put that aside, and I'll use that in, as we walk along in terms of some examples. Let me start with power. In thinking about a business model, the first thing that... Uh, strategists do is to work through the, the, the structure of the industry. So about 30 years ago, a professor at the Harvard Business School named Michael Porter uh, summarized a field of economics known as industrial organization into a handy checklist that has become known as uh, Porter's Five Forces. And the idea is simply to think, for one to think one's way through each of these elements of an industry and to examine who in this industry is likely to be making money based on the structure of the industry. Let me give you an example. Uh, so you can see what these five are, suppliers, buyers, substitutes, rivals, and new entrants. Let me start with suppliers. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were amused by uh, Apple's you know, teasing on Monday that something exciting was going to happen. On Tuesday, we discovered that uh, they are now selling the Beatles, uh, music on iTunes with a fantastic picture of them on the website if you went uh, and checked out yesterday or today. Now, while I haven't seen the contract between the Beatles and Apple, here's what I know is almost surely true. Apple is making no money from that deal. And how do I know? I know because what we were talking about in that business is the provision of music retail. And so Apple's in the business of providing a, a, a retail platform for you and I to buy music. And the supplier, the, an input into that process is the content that they sell. In this case, music. Now, in the case of the Beatles in particular, they are a monopoly supplier. In other words, there's only one source that can provide file, uh, music files of Beatles music. They have tremendous negotiating power. So without knowing anything that happened in the back rooms in that negotiating deal, I can predict likely what happened. What likely what happened is when they decided they were finally going to release their, their music in digital form uh, uh, via, via sound... Um, download, that they would have marched around and said, we're going to do this. Who's the highest bidder? Now, in this case, it's a little tricky because there's not a lot of direct competition to iTunes because there are multiple, uh, you know, th they almost not quite have a monopoly, but they've got a fair amount of market power, something approaching a monopoly. But essentially, the Beatles would sell to the highest bidder. So whatever price we are paying for a Beatles song, you can be sure almost all of it is going to the Beatles and almost none of it is being picked up by Apple because that supplier has tremendous market power. Now, if we go to Motion Metrics, the company that I described a few moments ago with the broken tooth system, uh, and we look at their industry, we say, okay, to, is there power, uh, uh, pardon me, suppliers, when I say buyers, I should have been saying suppliers, suppliers, uh, the Beatles are, the, are the, a supplier of music to Apple. Uh, who are the suppliers to Motion Metrics? Well, Motion Metrics uses off-the-shelf cameras, off-the-shelf acceler uh, accelerometers, off-the-shelf CPUs. In other words, they're not using, uh, none of their suppliers are monopolist suppliers. So they are buying things on a, in a competitive market. In other words, uh, we're not, I'm not worried when I look at the motion metrics business that they are going to be pinched by their suppliers, that their suppliers are going to limit their profit potential. Buyers. Uh, in the case of motion metrics, 
Who are their potential buyers? Who are their customers? Do they have market power? So there are some companies I work with, technology companies, who are specifically focused on, for example, a military op uh, application. The problem with companies who've got one product and that product has got a military application is that means they've got one customer. And that means that they have no negotiating power. And so no matter how good they are, we worry about their ability to generate a profit because they've got, they've got no way, they've got no leverage. And um, the same goes if in some case, in some healthcare settings, if you've got one buyer, the government, uh, that can be an issue. And so when it's the way to think about these Porter's Five Forces is to think about uh, the distribution of power in the economic setting in which that uh, transaction is happening. Now in the case of motion metrics, they're selling these devices that go on these shovels. The question the firm asks itself is which part of the value chain should it enter? Should it go to the OEMs the people that manufacture these big shovels? Should it go to the distributors? Because generally what happens is, let's say Komatsu makes machines, Komatsu will then use distributors and those distributors will get a monopoly in different territories. So there'll be one distributor who gets these four countries and another distributor gets these four countries and so on. So they could go to a distributor and sell to them or they could go directly to the mines and sell to them. Now you can imagine it's the same Technology, it's this, exactly the same device, regardless of which route they go. But each of those routes is a completely different business model. It's a different customer. So the upside to selling to the OEMs is that if you just sell to two OEMs, you've, you, you've got a, right there a big customer base because they've got so many machines. So there's only about four or five major players that make these uh, very large uh, mining shovels. So if you can knock off one or two of them, that's a big business. The problem is there's only three or four customers. And they've got tremendous negotiating power. So the upside is that they buy in volume, the downside is they've got tremendous power. Then there is the distributors. The distributors are also, on the upside to them, is that they represent a territory, so they uh, cover multiple mine sites and therefore have a larger buying power. The downside is that they are, again, a monopolist buyer for their territory. So the negotiating power with them is very, is very weak. Then there are the mines. And the mines uh, only have buying power over their particular mine. And there's much more back and forth in the negotiation in terms of working with the mines. Now, which is the right answer? Who knows? But that's the thought process, and in the end, uh, Motion Metrics explored all three. They met with distributors, they met with OEMs, they met with mines, and it seemed that the best decision, largely as a result of the negotiating power, the willingness to try an untested new product, was to go to the mines. Uh, and you can imagine, so the same goes through um, substitutes, rivals, new entrants, all of these things. In the case of substitutes, you know, the Substitutes and rivals, I find, are the, are the most interesting discussion with scientists and engineers because almost inevitably, especially if it's their first time they've built a product uh, and are trying to build a company, that they will almost inevitably tell you there are no substitutes. I've invented this. They, say, they might say, hey, I filed for a, for a patent. The, the people, the examiners at the USPTO, uh, they're, they're, they've issued me a patent. By definition, I'm novel. There are no substitutes. And I think of all the conversations about um, business people trying to navigate through their markets. Uh, for example, one with a senior executive from Visa who was talking about the strategy of the Visa credit card. And he said, you know, um, many people think of our main competitor as MasterCard. And in many senses it is. But at the end of the day, our strategy at the moment isn't focused on MasterCard because you know, we do something, they do something, and we get one or two percentage points of market share flipping back and forth. It's not a big deal. Where we're going after is where the crosshairs are not focused on MasterCard, they're focused on cash. We want to convert cash transactions into Visa transactions. 
And so that cash is, is you know, the, substitute, the substitute product. In the case of motion metrics, the substitute product was to do nothing. That's what the mines do now. They just, um, the, the broken tooth falls into the, the truck, the truck takes it to the crusher, the crusher goes down. They, that, it's built into their budget. They have a budget line that accounts for a certain amount of downtime of the crusher. And we'll talk about, uh, in, 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 a, in a subsequent slide, uh, some of the issues of trying to navigate around that. <clears throat> and rivals are, are somewhat obvious. New entrants are a little bit less obvious. The new end, so of course with rivals, the more rivals there are, uh, the less, the less uh, profit potential. You know, I have never seen the balance sheet for a falafel shop on Bloor Street, but here's what I can tell you for sure. Right? Their margins are almost zero. How do I know without ever seeing a balance sheet of a falafel shop on Bloor? Because I know that as you walk down Bloor Street, there are many rivals. And so if some falafel seller says that his falafels are better than anyone else's and he's going to charge $3 more for a, so a lunch is going to go from an 8 bucks to 11 bucks, you can be sure that the market will immediately punish that person. The price is set by the rivals, rivalry. And so all of us, with, uh, uh, even those of us who have never seen a balance sheet of, uh, uh, or financial or P&Ls of a falafel shop can know, because of its competitive environment, that their, that their margins are going to be close to zero. You know, basically, they'll be earning a, uh, the, the cost of capital uh, or less. Okay, so that's rivals. New entrants. The, the question for new, of new entrants is, uh, in the, so in the case of motion metrics, they've got their tooth detection system. And the question is, uh, in their case, was we spent a lot of time talking about, I'm on, I'm on the uh, board of that company, which is how I know various things about it, is that uh, the question was, do we file for some uh, patents uh, to protect the, some of the software innovations, uh, there were even some hardware innovations that we try and protect, or do we keep these as trade secrets? And of course, uh, for those of you who have spent any time uh, learning about patents, what you know is that the, the essence of the deal with the government in terms of a patent, which is to give you the right to exclude others to use that, uh, that, are, that uh, whatever is outlined in the claims of your patent, is that the deal is you have to disclose, right? In the claims of your patent, you disclose your invention. And so the deal is you disclose so that everyone can learn what you've done, and in return, we give you this right to exclude. Now, there's two problems from our perspective, from the perspective of motion metrics, in filing for a patent. The first is, how are we going to know when someone's infringing? Because there's a lot, there are a lot of ways that people can, once they learn what we're doing, that they can, in a sense, use our ideas but in, in, invent around what we're doing. And secondly, it's only good to have the right to exclude others if we have the cash to enforce it. And we don't have that. So we neither had sort of the ability to detect infringement, nor without going to great expense, nor the ability to enforce. So for us, for motion metrics, um, the decision was to, uh, to, go, to just maintain trade secret. Okay, uh, and of course, uh, whenever uh, somebody comes in to talk about their, their invention and their business plan, Almost the, you know, if it's a technology innovation, almost you know, the first question that, that they'll be asked is how easy is it to imitate what you're doing? How many other people are, have got a, a similar type of solution? What are the substitutes and how easy is it to imitate? <clears throat> okay, so now I'll, I'm gonna say a, a couple of comments about a specific kind of market. And that is uh, what, are, what is, being increasingly referred to as the market for ideas. So, in business schools, we spend a lot of time talking about traditional markets, markets for, for stuff you can touch, um, and how uh, the economics work in terms of buying and selling and, and so on. Um, ideas, intellectual property, have some interesting uh, uh, characteristics that influence how these markets work. So, the essence, what you should think of as the, the first order choice in terms of the market for ideas is when you have an invention, the, the decision of whether to sell the idea or to
to, to embed the idea into a product, build a product, and compete in the product market. So when you sell the idea, you can think of that as, just, as basically just licensing your idea. So maybe you build a prototype to show proof of concept, and then you license the right to use the idea versus uh, building, the, building the product. <clears throat> and so the essence of this, and I've listed, uh, I think that uh, the slides are put up online afterwards, so if, if anyone's interested, there's two very good papers that describe uh, in much more nuance than what I'm going to go over now. I'm just going to give you the key ideas. But if you're interested, there's a paper by David Teese, a professor at Berkeley, and followed by a paper by Joshua Gans and Scott Stern. Joshua's at the University of Melbourne, and Scott Stern's at MIT. Um, on uh, uh, for entrepreneurs working their way through thinking about the market for ideas and, and the conditions under which it makes sense to license versus uh, to build a product and sell. So uh, the, two, the two primary characteristics that they focus on in terms of the, you know, the, what has the, the largest effect on this decision are what they call the excludability environment and the complementary asset environment. And let me just sort of say this in as simple English, which is the excludability environment is how, to what extent can you protect your idea or prevent others from using it after they know about it? So to what extent can you tell someone about your, uh, your invention and explain to them how it works and at the same time prevent them from using it? And, and in most cases, the way to Think about that is how effective are patents in that setting. The second is this complementary uh, asset uh, issue, which is how important are other assets in bringing my product to market? So <clears throat> in the case of motion metrics, uh, the excludability environment was weak. That is, once if motion metrics were to try and sell its idea, to uh, someone else in, who is uh, selling other types of products to the mining industry. And if they were to, to they say, okay, look, tell us about your idea. Uh, once we've told them, the ability for us to prevent them from using it if we decide we don't want to work with them is low. In terms of complementary assets, in, our, in this business, in, the, in, the, in this mining business, and you can think about uh, you know, what these complementary assets might be in, in your own settings. In the, in the mining business, the number one complementary asset is distribution channels. So in other words, other companies who are in the business of, of selling uh, products to mines, what they've invested in, the big companies, who are, are potential either partners or competitors, is um, they've invested in a distribution network. You think about it, this is a tiny company founded by an uh, Iranian immigrant and staffed by uh, local Vancouver engineers, most of whom are masters or PhDs in double E, CS. And they are building a cool product, but the people who are going to buy it are in Africa and Australia and Chile and Argentina, countries that the, that the entrepreneurs have never been to in settings that are far different from a, a lab on the UBC campus, and that's where they've got to go do their sales. And so wouldn't it make a lot of sense to work with someone who's already invested in that complementary asset, that they've got a sales channel. They already go to those mines, and they're already f hopping on a plane, flying to those mine sites. They've already invested in relationships with the purchasing people in those mines. And they've already got a catalog of stuff with 27 other products that they sell to those mines. And this will just be product number 28. The marginal cost for them, the marginal cost for them to add one more product to their uh, portfolio of stuff that they sell to the mine is almost zero. And all of a sudden, the motion metrics product can get exposure to a vast uh, uh, client base versus young Dr. Tafazli Balundi uh, climbing onto a plane and making his first trip to Africa and his first trip to Australia and his first trip and so on uh, and arriving at mine sites which are very different uh, than university labs and trying to sell his product. The obvious upsides, what are the upsides to selling your idea versus 
building a product and competing in the product markets and actually trying to sell the device. Two first order issues. The first one is savings. In other words, if Motion Metrics has to rebuild that distribution network, in other words, now they need their own people getting on planes and flying to all these destinations to sell their product, they are duplicating the cost that somebody else has already incurred in setting up that network. So there is an overall loss of what economists would call welfare. It's wasteful to, 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 to uh, rebuild that. The second upside to selling your idea is, imagine, now in this case there was no other broken tooth system, but imagine this was a market where there was already a broken tooth system or, or there was already a competing product. If motion metrics enters with their product, even if, though it's a, even if it's a better product, just having competing products is going to harm both companies. It's going to have a downward pressure on price because there'll be some price competition. And so that will push prices down, which is good for the customers, but bad for the companies. So the upside to selling your idea, so let's just imagine in the stylized world that there's the new entrepreneur who's got his, his, his new and improved better product and the existing uh, incumbent company uh, that's already selling to that market. The upside to selling your idea to the existing company is that you benefit from the savings. In other words, you're not rebuilding uh, the, the, that, in this case, the distribution channel. And you're keeping that, a monopoly power in the, in the selling of that product. You're not uh, creating competition by having a second product and pushing down prices. So these are the upsides, uh, the first order upsides to engaging in the market for ideas, selling the idea rather than the product. On the flip side, uh, a, a Nobel winning economist named Ken Arrow um, at, at um, I can't remember if he's Berkeley or Stanford, um, came up with this, what he called the paradox, uh, the paradox of disclosure, uh, which is the, what most people describe as the first order downside of engaging the market for ideas, which is that once you, in order for, for the buyer, if you want to sell your idea, in order for the buyer to be able to properly assess your idea, they have to understand how it works. And once you tell them how it works, they don't need to buy it. And that causes what economists refer to as a market failure. A market failure means that I have something to sell and you want to buy it. And the price that you, want, that you would pay to, to me to buy it is higher than what I, it was, is my floor for selling it. In other words, we can create a value create, we can have a value creating transaction by, ex, by having our exchange. But we don't have it because I'm not willing to tell you what you need to know to buy it. Right? So, and, and, and the, you know, you, an example you can think about this is, are the, the many, many stories of software entrepreneurs who know that their product would be great for, for example, Microsoft, but will not make the trip to Redmond because they, you know, Microsoft, at least at one point, had developed a reputation for hearing about people's ideas and then, and then taking them. And of course, you know, the, the, the greatest dramatization of this is for those of you who've seen the film Flash of Genius and the story of the windshield wiper. Um, you know, if you haven't, th you know, this is a, a, a fantastic uh, just illustration of Ken Arrow's uh, paradox of disclosure and the ruin of someone's life. <clears throat> okay, so this, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, this is, but uh, for those of you who are very interested in the market for ideas, this is basically, they show how you can, a framework you can use a, a two by two matrix of just thinking about how important are complementary ideas in your whatever industry setting you're in and how important is it, how, what's your ability to exclude others once they've seen your idea. And then depending on, on where, where you are in the matrix, uh, uh, the framework gives you some, some intuition about the type of strategy that makes the most sense. And um, you know, the, the most common one in this bottom right hand box in terms of environments where there is high excludability, in other words, that's the ability to tell someone your uh, idea and at the same time prevent them from using it if, they, if you don't want them to, and high value to complementary assets is in life sciences. You know, so in other words, it's not at all surprising uh, in, in terms of this theory and framework that we see a lot, we see a, a very clear division of labor 
in life sciences in terms of biotech and big pharma. That that is a setting where the market for ideas really works. That there are a lot of businesses that are set up just on dr in drug discovery, and then they sell their product, uh, their, their license, their invention downstream to someone who's got the complementary assets, in that case, uh, expertise in running, in taking products through FDA approval process, in marketing and distribution, uh, and, and so on. So for anyone who's very interested in this market for ideas, I recommend the second paper in that list, the Gans and Stern paper, that goes through in detail uh, this framework. Okay, so that is, is, in summary, this issue of power. Thinking through who has the power in terms of power of co over complementary assets, the power over the ownership of, of the idea, the power in terms of these five forces. When, who has got power in the ecosystem in which your product uh, lives? And by understanding where the power lies, it influences the setup of the, uh, of the uh, um, business model. How are you gonna make money? Who are you gonna sell to? In motion metrics case, are we gonna patent or no? Are we going to sell to the OEMs, the distributor, or the patents? And the next issue here is incentives. Again, I'll just illustrate with an with a, with a example rather than talk about the economic theory because I think it's quicker to get the hang of it. In the case of motion, of motion metrics, they imagine how they walk into a mine and they say, our, we want to sell you our broken tooth detection system. It costs 100,000 bucks. Okay, so the average price for selling this system, depending on what we've, they've loaded onto the, the device, um, is, costs about 100 bucks a unit. Uh, pardon me, $100,000 a unit. Um, and one broken tooth, if it prevents one broken tooth, it's paid for. So these things have a very high R uh, ROI, a return on investment. The payback period, depending on how frequently teeth break in, in a particular mining setting, uh, is, can be very fast. So you might say to yourself, just applying uh, any form of reasonable logic, this sale is a no-brainer. This Iranian guy in Vancouver must be a bazillionaire. Um, how could he not? The value proposition is so great. But the sales cycle is long and hard. I don't know if you saw in the picture the bags under his eyes. Um, this, is, this is a tough sales cycle. Now here's why. The incentive systems inside these mining companies is tremendously complex. In many of these mines, the people who incur the cost of a broken tooth are different than the people who would pay, who make the buying decision. It's a different group within the same organization. And so, and the people who, are, who worry about the risk of a malfunction of the broken tooth detection system are different than the people who actually have to pay for the, for the um, who, who get the benefit of reduced broken teeth. So there are all sorts of different divisions in the same company, and, and this varies, by the way, from company to company. So each time Motion Metrics arrives at a company, they have to essentially sit down with the org chart and figure out who has what decision authority and what are the incentives of each person's uh, group. And so some, some groups have the incentive to, one group in the company uh, in the mine has the incentive to reduce broken teeth. Uh, one group has the incentives to minimize expenditures. One group has the incentives to anything they can build within their own technology mining group to build there as opposed to buy it on the outside. And working through the incentives becomes, it's not just a, a sort of an exercise of figuring out uh, what everyone wants, it affects the business model. Here's how. It affects the business model because there are, I'm just gonna simplify this, because it's obviously gonna be more complex than what I describe here. But there are essentially two ways to make money from selling broken tooth dis detection systems. One is to sell the system uh, and have your margin on the system. So let's say you know, we'll sell the system for 150K and then, we will, and, and then you know, for 10, an extra 10K or something, we'll sell you a, a, a warranty uh, that lasts for X number of years and then we'll look after all the parts and services and so on. Or we can sell you a system for 75K and where we look at the margins gonna be on all the upgrades and parts and services. 
And it depends on how the incentive systems work within the mine of who's in charge of parts and services, who's in charge of uh, uh, authorizing uh, the, you know, so, for example, customers often have different purchasing cr uh, decision criteria depending on the, the, the size of the purchase. If you're below a $100,000 purchase at a mine, you get this very sort of low, it only has to go through two committees. If it's over 100,000, it has to go through a third or fourth committee. And so, working through the incentives of who has to do what and whether in this mine it's better to sell it as a low, lower priced device with focusing on parts and services or as a, a bundle because it, it's much easier to, for the mine to bring it through as a million dollar purchase of 10 systems including parts and service is, is, uh, uh, turns out to be a very non-trivial part of the business model. And motion metrics, n biggest change in sales volume uh, was related to figuring this out. Was their first very significant purchase, which was to a major mine in the US, was when they worked through that uh, bundling products in a particular way that addressed these incentive issues um, uh, would, would move a much larger volume of product than what they had otherwise been moving. Okay, this is my last point, and then uh, we'll have time for, for a few questions. The other piece of uh, thinking through business models is how to capture the value. So in other words, uh, economists split apart the, 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 the concepts of creating value versus capturing value. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, TIFF, the Toronto Film Festival that every, most people in the city would be familiar with. TIFF creates an enormous amount of value for the city of Toronto. Anybody here who's ever tried booking a hotel for, for a family member or business associate or something, <laughs> while TIFF is on, will get a, a, you know, a real taste of what the effect is on the city. There is not a hotel room in the city to be had when TIFF is on. Now, what's amazing from the perspective of TIFF, so in other words, TIFF creates enormous amount of value, but TIFF captures a very small fraction of it. What they capture is through what, the ticket you and I buy for the box office. So they bring all these people in from around the world who, who stay in hotels and eat at restaurants and buy all sorts of stuff and take taxis, but they capture 12 bucks a ticket or, or whatever the ticket price is um, uh, at the box. That's all they capture. Disney did the same thing. About 15 years ago or 20 years ago, they had a, a, a big strategy retreat where they said, you know what? We are driving family vacations to Anaheim and Orlando. People are spending $4,000 on a holiday and we're capturing $70 as they walk through the gates of Disneyland. We are triggering a $4,000 spend and we're capturing only 70 bucks. And that's when they started moving into uh, booking, helping you book your, your flights and, and your accommodations so you stay in Disneyland, uh, affiliated hotels and so on to capture a larger and larger piece of this. So thinking through about the difference between creating value and capturing value. Uh, in the case of, uh, well, I'll just split this into two topics, subtopics. One is the complementary products. So everyone's familiar with razors and blades. The idea here is that you sell the razors at a low price, and so you want people to adopt your razor standard, and then you, and you have no margin on the razor, you make it on the blades. And, um, and so, to be clear, the important ingredient to make that business model work is two things. One, you have to sell both razors and blades. If you're in just selling the razor business, and you, then you're, you're, you're going to have your price pinched by the guys who have both razors and blades uh, because they're going to be pushing down the price of razors, and, and uh, they're making all the margins on the blade. The second thing, if you want to compete in this market, is it's important that, your, that no one else can make blades for your razor. Otherwise, you're giving your, your razors away uh, at cost, and you're making nothing on, your, on the blades because other people are, are uh, pushing the price down on blades by competing in, in the blade market. Same with consoles and games. Uh, and so they're two very different business models. Right? We've seen some game systems where the, where the company keeps, both makes the console and controls the majority of games on their console. And, and in which case, they can follow a business model where they have a low price console because they'll make up their margins on games. As opposed to other uh, 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 companies where they manufacture the consoles and they have very little control over the games. 
they have to make their console, they have to make their margins on the games. Uh, uh, pardon me, on the uh, on the consoles. Same in recorded music. The only reason that Apple can make the iTunes business work and all the other music companies who tried and failed couldn't was because Apple could create this business with virtually no margins going to Apple. You know, it's more or less a, uh, at least what the, uh, is understood by the analysts, it's a, it's a break-even business. But it, it makes a lot of sense for them to make that market work because they make all their margins on the hardware. And if you're competing with them and you're only competing in the selling music online business and you don't have a hardware piece to sell, uh, then you can't compete. <clears throat> in the case of, I mentioned already, Motion Metrics, they had the distinction between the, uh, the hardware, the, the CPU, the accelerometers and cameras, and all of the others, the service parts and upgrades. And we would balance between the main device and all the others in terms of the, the business model on a client by client basis. Okay, so that's the last thing here to talk about in terms of business model construction is thinking about, thinking very hard about who all the actors are in your uh, ecosystem. So, you know, you could imagine Steve Jobs telling his designers, I want a phone, I want a device that can do all this stuff. And he goes through the list of stuff. Of it. He's, he's going to blow people's minds. It's going to be able to do this, 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 and this. It's going to have these features, these features, and these features. And by the way, it's going to cost $199. And you can imagine uh, his, his engineers and team saying, that's impossible. Like, we can give you one or the other. We can give you, you know, a $600 device, or we can give you a $200 device, but the $200 device is not going to have all these features. Um, unless, of course, you figure out who else is, can pay for you. In this case, uh, we'll, how about if we, we have the carrier pay, AT&T will pay, and we'll give them a monopoly. And a monopoly will, uh, will to, we will extract some of the monopoly prices, and so they'll pay even more for this device than they will for uh, subsidizing another device. We see that in magazines all the time. Same thing. There are two customers to magazines. You and I, when we pay at the newsstand to buy our magazine, and the advertisers. Same thing in many discount travel. Discount travel, the reason that you can pay very often such a low amount in Europe to get from A to B is because you're going from secondary airport in, in, in uh, city A to secondary airport, and that the person who's, the company that's transporting you is actually getting paid a per body fee for dropping you off in a remote location where you're likely to spend some money. It's the same model as advertising. Same for TIFF. The, the Toronto Film Festival realized that, wait a minute, we are creating all this value, but we're only capturing a small fraction at the box office, and the rest is going throughout the city. It makes sense for the city to, to, to give us back some of that money. So, you know, TIFF gets a, a significant amount of, amount of money from the city. Um, and so you can work through for, uh, from case to case to case that there's, not all, there's often more than just the obvious customer. There might be a second or third cust customer type that, that your business model, in other words, you know, is your business model going to be, I'm just going to sell my product to uh, the customer, let's say a magazine with no advertising, so there's one customer, or am I going to make that product 30% cheaper or 80% cheaper and pick up the rest of my uh, in income from another customer, in, that, in this case, advertisers. Okay, that's the main points I wanted to cover. So three big issues in thinking about business models. Power, who's got the power in your industry setting? And, and uh, once you, th in thinking that through, it helps you design what your business model will be. Second is the incentives. What, do, what are the incentives of all the players uh, in your uh, ecosystem? And thirdly, uh, what are all the, who are all the potential customers? Uh, in, terms of, in terms of capturing the value, can you capture the value from complementary products, and are there multiple customer types in your industry setting? And uh, we have a few minutes for questions. If there are no questions, there's one thing I'll do. If somebody has got a, a product uh, or sort of some, an invention that they're working on, we can go through very quickly in the whatever four minutes we have for questions, 
Uh, I will ask you a series of questions, and you'll see how this industry analysis works. Yes, if you can go to the mic. Hello, um, my name is Peter, and uh, I have a question of, now it's uh, talking about business model, and uh, my business model is we, we try to help the small and medium business customer to reshake up their business model. So how can you help my business model? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. Okay, so let's, let, this, is, this is definitely not what I was expecting, but let's try. So is, is you're from a consulting firm? Yes. And so, in your, and, uh, and so here's the key question for business models. How do you make your money? We get the customer. Do you, do you sell them a report? Do you bill by the hour? Do you bill by a, uh, a, a fixed fee? We bill by five US dollars per minute. Five US dollars per minute? Yes. And so uh, describe for me an, an example client. Uh, if the customer, they have, they have too many customers to handle. Don't, no, don't, don't give me a generic. Just, you don't have to say the name of a company. Just describe a, uh, a client. In other words, like are they for a client in the pharmaceutical business that has this, this problem and this is how you interact with them? Okay. One uh, internet service client, uh, my, okay, one local store, they have too many customers. Then they, they don't have enough people to handle. Then they don't have capacity to handle the customer. So we help them to increase their capacity. That means we reset up their business model to get more people to work for them or to have their business process more smoothly. Okay. And so they come to you and they, just, they say to you, we've got a problem. Yes, because we How do you build them on a, on a $5 a minute basis? How does that work? Uh, we, we sit down to talk with them. And is this over the internet? Uh, we can talk over the phone. And you charge $5 internet? a minute? No, no, no. Before we make sure, before we can convince the customer to pay us $5 per minute, we cannot even get one cent from their pockets. Okay, so the first thing is they're in the consulting business. So we think, okay, the, the market, the rivals are everyone else who's providing advice to companies to improve their business. Uh, so right away, uh, I'm thinking this is a, and it's likely, unless you have a particular niche, is there, are you focused on a particular niche of a type of a company? We provide the, uh, we provide the, uh, we focus on employing internet technology, that does mean uh, salesforce.com CRM. CRM does mean customer relationship management. And also e-commerce solution and call center solution. Okay, I'm gonna take this one offline, but here's what, here's, here's what I, what, just in, in general uh, response to a question like this. So I would think to myself, in his business, first of all, who are his suppliers? Sounds to me like, uh, my guess, I'm just gonna make a bunch of guesses to make this go faster. His suppliers are, the inputs to his business are people who can quickly assess uh, business models in order to provide recommendations. That's the only way they're gonna make money is if they've got people who can quickly assess and give recommendations in a reasonably short period, you know, billion dollars per minute, it means they're not competing with McKinsey and you know, high-end consulting firms. They're gonna be competing on small, uh, low profile projects would be my guess. And so, uh, so first off, I'd be thinking who are the, the suppliers or people that have this skill set? And if they are rare, then they're going to be basically, he, most of his income he'll be paying to those people. In other words, this, uh, I would worry that this is not going to be a high profit business for him because he's going to be paying his experts uh, virtually everything he makes. Uh, and unless he's got some way to bring in business that those people wouldn't be able to bring in themselves. Then I'll look at his customers, and I'll say, do his customers have any negotiating power? The answer to me sounds like no. These are small companies, mid-sized companies. They are not gonna have any negotiating power. Then I'll look at rivals. I'll say, are there a lot of rivals? Are there a lot of competitors for people that provide advice to improve the performance of companies? The answer is gonna be yes. So unless he's got some kind of niche or, or he's using technology in a particular way that gives him some advantage, I'm gonna worry that he's just gonna have a lot of pressure on his ability to make profits simply by rivalry. Then I'll look at new entrants. If he's got some clever approach to doing this, is it easy to imitate? Um, I haven't heard, so I can't comment. 
uh, and, and then I'll look at complements and substitutes. And essentially, as you can see, I work my way down the list, and I think to myself, in each one of these, uh, you know, where's the profit potential? And where I would drive without, with only hearing what you heard in eight and whatever, 19 seconds of his description, my sense would be that I would spend any time that I spend with him talking about developing his business model would be on differentiation. I would be focused on, can he, is there a particular type of company that he could, that would be very suitable to this one $5 a minute type of payment scheme that is going to just need a sort of a short fix of, uh, of input on revising their business model that's maybe in a vertical, so maybe it's going to be, you know, internet startup companies, or maybe it's going to be, you know, whatever the vertical is, so they develop some expertise. That's how I would focus. My guess is that where we would end up is, for his company, is on a business model that focuses on differentiation in the consulting business with a unique uh, uh, delivery model and, um, and positioned in such a way that it was very distinct from the competitors of providing uh, consulting services because that's the only way he'll get any margin. Okay. Hi. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the customers. So um, let's take an example of a chemical industry. So I have a raw material that could go to the chemical industry. So I can go directly to customers or using a distributor to uh, sell my product. Uh, is, how do you handle the conflict if I go to one customer and then I go to distributor so I will be a competitor to my own distributor? And right, that's, so that's just an assignment of territory. So that's just a matter of assigning to your distributor, negotiating what the territory of that, of that distributor would be. All right. And also in, in that scenario, do you see any other potential customer? Uh, you mean customer as a, being either the, I mean, I don't, I need to know the product, but, but um, in essence, you, what you're asking me is that there's the end buyer and the distributor are two kinds of customers. Mm -hmm. And so without knowing the product, I can't, I can't say anything about who else uh, other, other customers could be. All right. All right. We'll take one more question and then we'll and continue on. Sure. In this product development specifically, how did you find the right salespeople? Like, did you use an agency? Did you do something magical? Did you just happen to know them? Did you talk with people? That's a great question. So first off, I would say that this company doesn't have the right salespeople. Um, it's the company is going through what I see very often as a long and torturous process of turning from an engineering company into a product company. And so the way the sales re really have developed our sales staff is uh, people who were originally hired to work on technical problems that had slightly better social skills than the people who didn't. <laughs> and they evolved into uh, you know, answering the phone and they would be sent to the trade shows to man the booths and they ultimately, one day, they arrived in the website, changed their name from, uh, you know, a technical person working on this to salesperson. Are they well paid? They are, you know, they're, they're paid at a rate that is uh, equivalent to what they would be paid as a technical person. And my view, this company, and the so CEO knows this, so I know this thing goes up in the web and he'll probably watch it, so apologies. Um, but... Uh, he, he knows, in my view, that the, the company is way understaffed on sales. It's is way under focused on sales, and the, uh, it is what it is. Uh, he's the CEO, and it is uh, extremely common. It's very common for for companies I find with people that have engineering and sales background. You know, almost no parent. There's almost no parents that I ever met who look at their kids when they're growing up and say, you know, I want you to grow up and be a salesperson. <laughs> you know, engineers, yes. Scientists, yes. Salespeople and lawyers, yes. But the most important thing, uh, once the prototype has been built, is sales. And uh, you know, I think one of the most, for example, one of the most successful business people of uh, young entrepreneurs that's come out of engineering in Toronto, uh, U of T, is uh, Anthony Lacavera, who runs uh, Global Live and the Wind, the Wind phone uh, phone company. And when you talk to Anthony even though he's a graduate from their engineering department, the immediate thing you're struck by, this guy is a sales guy. He's, he is just 
he is a tremendously powerful salesperson. And I think if there was one mindset that I could, uh, you know, that, that the, this whole exercise at Mars and the Rotman School and so on can contribute to in the Toronto community, is impressing upon scientists and engineers the value of salespeople. In other words, recruit a, sale, a senior salesperson that you really care about, that's, that you put in a, a same level of authority as the most senior technical person in your firm and pay them commensurate with you know, a person who's excellent at their trade. Their trade is sales. 